Coming up next, the family computer crosses the 10-year mark, not gasping for air, but riding the wind of a rising star. To find out more, stay here for the story of Kirby's adventure. This is GTV, a breath of fresh air. On March 23, 1993, Hoshino Kirby, you may know Izumi no Monogatari, was released for the Nintendo Family Computer in Japan. A few months later, the game went abroad as Kirby's Adventure. Nearly three years after the Super Famicom had been released, many were surprised that such an impressive game could be made on such an old piece of hardware, and that anyone would bother to do such a thing at all, rather than going the 16-bit route. At the end of 1990, with the 16-bit era in full swing, it seemed like the days of the family computer were numbered. Though the FC hung in there, doing so defied the odds, as Nintendo never expected the machine to make it to three years, let alone ten. Back in the early 80s, the parameters set for the family computer were to build a TV game machine that could bring home Nintendo's arcade offerings, namely Donkey Kong, at an affordable price. Upon release in 1983, the family computer was expected to have a short shelf life, quickly surpassed by better technology. In September 1985, Nintendo released the game that they considered to be the family computer's final farewell, Super Mario Bros. At the time, it was the most advanced game around. While future games were expected to be bigger and better, Nintendo deemed the cartridge format to have reached its technical limit, without being cost prohibitive. In the pipeline for 1986 was the Disk System, an add-on for the family computer that allowed games that were four times the size of Super Mario Bros. at half the price of cartridge games. While the Disk System featured some great games, The Legend of Zelda, Kid Icarus, and Super Mario Bros. 2, the format didn't fully catch on. Less than half of family computer owners invested in one. At the same time, the memory size of cartridges expanded beyond the capacity of a disc, with the price falling dramatically as well, rendering the disc system obsolete. In 1988, Super Mario Bros. 3 was released on a cartridge, with a memory size 12 times greater than the original Super Mario. Along with a specialty chip inside, the Memory Management Controller, MMC for short. The MMC allowed for graphical tricks such as multi-directional scrolling and split-screen graphics. There were several versions of this chip made, but the most popular was the MMC3 that Super Mario 3 and many others had. Concurrently, Nintendo was readying the 16-bit Super Famicom. With this new machine, hundreds of colors and dozens of sprites could be shown on screen, along with much better music on cartridges that could be several times larger than Mario 3, all done without the need for extra chips like the MMC. Many expected that the Super Famicom would take the lead while the older family computer faded away. But the older 8-bit hardware surprisingly survived. The large existing user base, about 15 million in Japan by 1991, combined with a deep bench of programmers who knew the hardware inside and out, kept things running with fun, affordable games. Alongside all of that, Nintendo also had the portable Game Boy that offered scaled-down versions of the most popular games anywhere you go. Beginning in 1989, established series such as Mario, Castlevania, Mega Man, Metroid, and Final Fantasy began to have Game Boy releases. The Game Boy was also home to many experimental games, some of which got their start on the portable screen, moving elsewhere later. Tetris was the first of these, and by far the most popular in those early days. In 1990, Japanese game publisher HAL Laboratory recruited a young graduate named Masahiro Sakurai. Having never created a video game before, he played around with the tools HAL had provided, including a makeshift toolkit built from a family computer and disk system. Sakurai eventually created a peculiar game starring a floaty puffball who could inhale enemies and use them as projectiles. He could also fly by inhaling the air around him. This offered a challenge, as while in flight, the character's attack drops you to the ground. The choice of fight or flight offered a unique spin on the standard run-and-jump type of game common in those days. 
Sakurai named this character Popopo, which sounds like the flutter noise he makes when flying. Popopo was initially designed as a simple placeholder character until something more sophisticated would replace him. Over time, the team at HAL grew to like the design. Popopo became permanent. The game, titled Twinkle Popo, was previewed and advertised across Japan in early 1992. The response was disheartening, as only 26,000 cartridges were pre-ordered from stores, far less than what was required to break even. HAL Laboratory reached out to Nintendo to publish the game, which led to Popopo being renamed Kirby. Twinkle Popo was retitled Hoshi no Kirby, meaning in English, Kirby of the Stars. Nintendo released the game on April 27, 1992, backed with all of the resources Nintendo had at its disposal. While the initial reception of Twinkle Popo was quite cold, Hoshi no Kirby became the number one best-selling game in Japan in May 1992. By the end of the year, the game had sold over one million copies in Japan, while also being released elsewhere in the world as Kirby's Dreamland. Lifetime sales would exceed 5 million. Kirby's rocket ride to the top prompted immediate talk of expanding Dreamland into a long-running, proper series. With backing from Nintendo, not only was that possible, but now, for Sakurai and HAL Laboratory, the sky was the limit. With a second Kirby game on the drawing board, Sakurai chose the family computer as the destination for this game. Despite being a decade old, Kirby was about to prove there were still some tricks that the old machine could do. Kirby's Dreamland was a fun and inventive game. However, it was also short and rather simple, thanks to the technical limits of the Game Boy, as well as being produced by a small team at HAL Laboratory. For the follow-up game, with support from Nintendo, HAL Laboratory rejected the initial idea of simply porting Kirby's Dreamland, instead setting out to make a new Kirby game that was as big and bold as possible. Most of Kirby's Dreamland was done by Masahiro Sakurai himself while learning the ins and outs of game design as a rookie employee. With Nintendo backing the project, the staff expanded. The core team comprised some of the biggest names around, past and present. Masahiro Sakurai took on the role of designer and director. Often in game design, these jobs overlap, especially when the game is the result of a singular person's creation. Satoru Iwata served as producer, as he had for Kirby's Dreamland. Starting with Golf in 1984, he designed many of the classic family computer titles published by Nintendo in those early days. Shigeru Miyamoto would join him as co-producer, at the helm of dozens of games including multiple Marios and Zeldas. Does Shigeru Miyamoto really need much of an introduction? Takao Shimizu also had a hand in the production, working mostly as a liaison between HAL and Nintendo. Hiroaki Suga programmed the game. His resume goes back to the adventures of Lolo, which he created. Takashi Saito assisted with character and stage designs, having experience in building the stages for Hole in One Golf and Uchu K Bitai SDF, two games featuring finely detailed graphics throughout. Jun Ishikawa composed the soundtrack, just as he had with Kirby's Dreamland. Background music tracks were created that captured the excitement of each area, retained the feel of the original Dreamland, and greatly outnumbered the compositions found in the original game. With the exception of Masahiro Sakurai, the staff had years of experience and many best-selling and beloved games under their belts. 
Each core member of the team had experience producing a game with at least one other member, allowing for a tight-knit group that worked well and stayed focused throughout production. With the plans laid down to create a wholly new game, every asset would be built from scratch. Sure, it would have been easy to move things over from Dreamland, but a fresh start allowed for many ideas to take hold. Soon after, the story and the gameplay would take shape. One day, the peaceful life of Dreamland was shattered by a mysterious crisis. The inhabitants didn't dream. On the edge of Dreamland, dreams and hope once gushed forth from the Dream Spring, fueled by the Star Rod. Investigating the Dream Spring, Kirby found naughty King Dedede swimming in its magical waters. Dedede had broken the Star Rod and given the pieces to his friends, who are now hiding in Dreamland. To bring back the lost dreams, Kirby sought the Star Rod. With the Dream Spring being central to the plot of the game, Masahiro Sakurai and his team gave the game the rather lengthy Japanese title, Hoshi no Kirby, Yume no Izumi no Monogatari, in English, the story of the Fountain of Dreams. When the game was released worldwide, Nintendo adopted the shorter, catchier title of Kirby's Adventure. Out of all the new design choices, one that might seem like a big change is something that had intended to be the same from the beginning. Kirby had always been envisioned as being pink, despite Masahiro Sakurai never outwardly expressing this design choice. Naturally, on the Game Boy, Kirby had no color, even though he was colored pink on the Japanese box. Shigeru Miyamoto and the entire staff had thought Kirby was white, maybe yellow. They were surprised at the revelation, but felt in the end the choice of color was a good move. Outside of Japan, Kirby was colored white on the Dreamland box, which might also confuse the audience. Perhaps the opening animation where Kirby is drawn and painted was the easiest way to tell everyone. In Dreamland, Kirby has the power to breathe in enemies and objects, then force them out as a projectile to attack or clear the way. Some items like microphones and bombs have a special effect to them. This idea was expanded upon in Adventure, as Kirby would be able to copy abilities by breathing in items or enemies, then pushing down on the control pad to activate them. Over 40 copy abilities were drafted during the design stage. 25 made the final cut. Here are just a few that can be helpful. With Beam, Kirby slings an electric whip. The attack doesn't reach very far, but can pass through walls and have a wide radius for coverage above and below. Spark creates an electrified force field around Kirby that can zap enemies at close range. It's great for a last minute defense, especially when energy is low and you have nothing else left to save you. Parasol is extremely useful. You can attack with the parasol like a sword, raise it over your head for protection, and use it to glide down slowly from high places. Wheel lets Kirby transform into a rolling tire. He can move at a very fast speed, skipping over everything in the stage, as well as attacking enemies head on by running them over. Other copies like sword and laser are more straightforward and self-explanatory. Over the course of the game, each copy will serve a purpose to get you out of trouble. So look out for them and experiment by eating as many things as you can. Not every item Kirby eats will produce a copy ability. Sometimes you get nothing. Dreamland was a rather small game with only five worlds, each consisting of a few substages. Like many early Game Boy games, Dreamland is very short and can be completed in about 45 minutes or less. In Adventure, there are eight worlds, with most having six stages. Each of these have substages that move in all directions. Over the course of the game, Kirby will travel high in the sky, tunnel underground, climb towers, and reach the bottoms of lakes. The eight worlds have cute names, with alliteration in each one. Ice Cream Island, Grape Garden, Orange Ocean. It's a nice touch that adds to the light-hearted look of the game. The letter of each stage also matches the letter of the color that the title card background uses. For example, Yogurt Yard has a yellow background. Butter Building has a blue one. An interesting nuance that you might not notice. The worlds are connected by doors that are unlocked over the course of the game. These are accessed by switches found in most stages. The concept of accessible doors on the map harks back to the final stage of Dreamland, 
when each boss must be replayed, with the player having the choice of battling in a preferred order. The stage progression, and how each successive stage is reached, is reminiscent of Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World. The color of the switches denote what kind of area you're unlocking. Arenas are unlocked through red switches, and let Kirby face off against the boss in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Winning the battle grants you that enemy's copy ability. Museums, found through blue switches, offer a free copy item by simply eating a statue of that enemy. Kirby can't get hurt in the museum, so it's far easier than arenas. Warp Star stations are accessed via yellow switches and transport Kirby quickly from level to level. Mini games are opened after pressing green switches. Crane Fever is a fun prize machine game that lets you pick up Kirby dolls for extra one-ups. Larger dolls give two lives, while the smaller ones, just one. Egg Catcher pits Kirby against King Dedede in a boxing ring. Dedede throws large amounts of eggs and bombs at Kirby. It's his job to eat as many eggs as he can without eating any bombs. If you win, extra lives are your reward. Quick Draw pits Kirby against a rival gunman in an Old West style duel. Be the fastest draw when fire is called. It kind of feels like Wild Gunman, but don't worry, the guns aren't real. Each shot propels a boxing glove that hits your opponent, knocking his hat off. Collecting the hats brings in bonus points and one-ups. There is one more minigame that occurs at the end of each stage, the goal game, where Kirby jumps from a spring platform for a bonus. With the right timing, the highest levels can be reached for bonus one-ups. If you can't make it to the top, bonus points are rewarded instead. There's also a special version of the game rewarded to only the best players. If you can beat the game with 100% completion, Extra Mode is unlocked as an option in the menu. In Extra Mode, Kirby only has three bars of energy, and saving the game is not allowed. Completing Extra Mode unlocks the music player, where you can freely listen to all background music and in-game sound effects. Visually, the team knew that there would be more color to work with than the Game Boy, but would also have to contend with Adventure being sold alongside 16-bit games which could easily outdo the visuals on the family computer without trying. The design team took the unusual step of drafting the stages, background, and everything else on paper first as artwork, which would then be converted into digital graphics afterwards. This ensured that the action in the background would be just as busy as that of the foreground. Not a single space of background goes unused. Part of this sorcery lies in the use of the MMC3 chip. The most common feature in games with the MMC3 is the ability to split the screen that allows two planes of graphics to run at the same time. While the action is happening on top, the bottom panel displays all relevant information. Kirby's health, the boss's health, the score, and which copy ability, if any, is in effect. The split screen is best remembered in Super Mario Bros. 3, which served a similar purpose. In Adventure, the bottom panel was made bigger than the one in Mario 3 to show more detail in the design of each copy ability. The bottom panel is also animated, with the health meter shining and Kirby's life icon dancing. The playfield in the upper portion is now smaller than a usual family computer game. Kirby is still the same size as he was in Dreamland, which made everything around him look bigger. The game has an ultra-wide letterbox look to it that lets Kirby fly around everywhere on screen without the game feeling cramped or sacrificing anything in the stage design. All of the graphical detail, moving backgrounds, color changes, fading in and out, rotation, and somehow no on-screen flicker makes Kirby's adventure approach a 16-bit presentation. When the final product wrapped up at the end of 1992, Kirby's Adventure became the largest family computer game Nintendo had ever published, with a memory size of 6 megabits, along with the MMC3 chip and a battery backup for game saves. It would be the second largest family computer game ever released. Only Metal Slater Glory, also produced by HAL Laboratory, was bigger at 8 megabits. On March 23, 1993, Hoshi no Kirby, Yume no Izumi no Monogatari, went on sale in Japan, with Kirby's Adventure following worldwide soon after. After nearly 10 years into the life of the family computer, Nintendo showed everyone the true power of 8 bits.
When Kirby went on sale in 1993, it surprised the industry and game fans alike. While there was still a steady stream of 8-bit games in Japan and in the West, the amount had declined since the dawn of the 16-bit era, with very few releases per month. As the sun was setting on the 8-bit days, nobody saw a mammoth release like Kirby's Adventure coming. In the early weeks of 1993, the Japanese ad campaign for Kirby began. Simple print ads appeared in gaming magazines that showed many of the copy abilities featured in the game. Shortly thereafter, Nintendo produced a TVCM made entirely of stop-motion animation, showing Kirby in action. Upon release in March, Famitsu Magazine offered a full review of Kirby, explaining all of the major points of the game, along with some of the finer details. The cross-review team issued a score of 33 out of 40, saying the game was jam-packed with features, how an action game is supposed to be, and that Kirby doesn't quite exactly feel like Mario or Sonic. Other issues of the magazine revealed many of the in-game secrets, including how to win the goal game every time. Hold down the A button for exactly 2.33 seconds. Another article interviewed the musical group Tama, who performed the music for Kirby's Japanese TV CM. The group recalled the experience in the studio as fun and exciting, with all four members saying they were big Nintendo fans, even admitting that the night before recording, they all had stayed up too late playing Super Mario Kart. Sales figures for the new 8-bit Kirby in Japan were very impressive. The game debuted at number two on Famitsu's top 30 charts and stayed near the top throughout the spring of 1993. All games eventually drop off in sales, but months later, Kirby still hung in there. The popularity of the new Kirby game reinvigorated sales of the older Dreamland on Game Boy, allowing that title to re-enter the top 30 after exiting the countdown over a year before. When it was all said and done, Hoshi no Kirby, Yume no Izumi no Monogatari, sold over 1 million units in Japan the last family computer game to do so. In the US, the Nintendo Entertainment System was still selling well, despite the 16-bit wars taking up the headlines. 1993 would become one of the strongest years of quality NES releases, despite being rather small, all anchored by Kirby's Adventure. Once the game was released in Japan, previews began to appear in American gaming magazines, often with the title of Kirby's Dreamland. Nintendo Power was the best source for information on the upcoming game, naturally, announcing a release scheduled for May 1993, then covering the game in depth. Maps of each world were detailed with strategies for each one, as well as how to use each copy ability and win at each minigame. Nintendo Power praised the graphical detail of the game, but warns that the cute visual style belies the challenge that the game offers. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed Kirby's Adventure in June 1993, explaining the game's mechanics and story. The review crew issued a score of 33 out of 40, saying the characters and gameplay are cut from Nintendo's strongest molds, an absolute blast to play, and a vast improvement over the Game Boy version. GamePro Magazine reviewed Kirby's Adventure in September 1993, issuing a perfect score. The review called the game one of the best 8-bit games ever, while praising the Art Deco-style graphics and symphonic sound in every other paragraph. The US was only the first stop on Kirby's worldwide adventure. The game would be released concurrently elsewhere in North and South America. Club Nintendo, the official publication in Mexico and other Latin American nations, reviewed the game in July 1993, touting the 6 megabit memory size. Adding that Kirby is constantly changing shape, the game is never monotonous and full of funny details. In Canada, a special French version of Kirby's Adventure was sold in the province of Quebec, the only NES game that was translated for that region. The UK and most of Europe received Kirby's Adventure in September 1993. Reviews were as equally positive on the continent as they were everywhere else. Joypad Magazine from France reviewed Kirby's Adventure in their September 1993 issue with a score of 90% for gamers ages 12 and up. The article remarks that the graphics rival those on the Super NES, 
while the music is sublime, concluding that in Kirby, a new Mario is born with all the right ingredients to make a hit game. In addition to versions in English and French, the game was also translated into German. In those days, most European distribution was not handled by Nintendo directly, leading to some nations, such as the United Kingdom, not having a large Nintendo user base, while other countries, like Sweden, did. It also meant that across Europe, different versions of games could appear. Usually, this only extended to box art. But a few games were independently translated. Germany was the only large-sized European nation in the early 90s, where Nintendo and Sega competed head-to-head, -head, with Nintendo coming out on top. Whether games released in the German language was the cause or the effect of this is still up for debate. The Club Nintendo magazine in Germany, unrelated to the one in Mexico, also reviewed Kirby's adventure in depth across multiple issues in 1993. Exactly like the official Nintendo publications elsewhere, these reviews covered every world, offering tips, secrets, and advice. As Kirby traveled around the world, the overall sales numbers increased to 1.75 million. Had Kirby's adventure been able to stay on sale as long as Super Mario Bros. 3 or The Legend of Zelda, that number could have been much higher. The popularity of the game is unquestioned, as Kirby was able to best both Zelda and Mario 3 on Nintendo Power's Top 20 charts in 1993. The rankings were based on a mix of sales and reader input, leading to older fan favorites skewing the results. As a final nod to the impact this pink puffball had, Kirby won the Nintendo Power Award for Best Hero of 1993, beating out Fox McCloud, Mario, Bubsy, Mega Man, Link, and the Lost Vikings. Tiens, c'est le jeu Kirby de Nintendo. C'est Kirby, ça? Je le pensais super puissant. Il a l'air d'une mauvaise. Pour combattre ses ennemis, Kirby les aspire. Hein. With Kirby's adventure, Nintendo had the perfect game to ride the 8-bit era off into the sunset. A huge game with amazing graphics and sound that featured a cute character with much to prove. In the fall of 1993, Nintendo redesigned the family computer and NES into a low-cost model that fixed many design flaws the original hardware had. In the US in particular, Kirby was promoted alongside the new NES staying in print all the way to the end when Nintendo ceased the sale of new 8-bit games in 1995. In Japan, Kirby's Adventure became a favorite at used stores, giving Nintendo more than enough reason to keep the family computer in production until 2003. Kirby would return with Dream Land 2 on the Game Boy and Dream Land 3 on the Super Famicom and Super NES somewhat keeping adventure off to the side as the main series rolled on. Along the way, spin-off games like Dream Course and Pinball Land were released. Much like how Kirby helped sustain the 8-bit line late in life, he came to be a cleanup hitter of sorts for Nintendo. Dream Land 3, The Crystal Shards, Tilt and Tumble, and Extra Epic Yarn were some of the very last games Nintendo released on their respective hardware, giving the player one more reason to hang on to so-called old tech. Kirby's Adventure received a remake in 2002 with Nightmare in Dreamland for the Game Boy Advance. The core gameplay and stages remain the same, but feature a graphical overhaul and reworked soundtrack. Upgrades to the original adventure include extra mini-games, a four-player mode, and the ability to unlock Meta Knight as a playable character in the game. The original adventure later saw re-release on the Virtual Console service and Kirby's Dream Collection, released to celebrate the series' 20th anniversary. Some challenges from Kirby's Adventure were also featured in Volume 2 of Famicom Remix and NES Remix. 
Kirby's Adventure was released on the Nintendo 3DS as part of the 3D Classics series. The gameplay is identical to the original game from 1993, but features a few modern niceties like autosaves. What stands out in this re-release is the 3D background effect that enhances an already great graphical presentation. Unfortunately, the only way to truly see it for yourself is on the 3DS. While hardware and software of the past fade away, in the modern day, Kirby's Adventure can be found as one of the 30 games on the NES Classic Edition and Family Computer Classic Mini, as well as the Nintendo Switch online service. Whatever comes down the pike next for Nintendo, it's a safe bet Kirby, his adventure, and his other greatest hits will be there to be discovered or rediscovered in the future. As for HAL Laboratory and the team behind Kirby's Adventure, the success of the game changed the course of the company and Nintendo forever. While Nintendo has never owned HAL outright and the studio remains independent, the two companies became closer than ever before, leading to partnerships in jointly owned ventures that controlled the direction of Kirby and other series. Masahiro Sakurai would leave HAL in 2003, creating his own startup, Sora, with a controlling interest owned by Nintendo. Sakurai is most well known these days for the Super Smash Bros. series and has served as director of in each entry ever since. In addition to his work on other games, including Meteos and Kid Icarus Uprising, Masahiro Sakurai has earned a high profile through interviews and public speaking, where he gives his thoughts and opinions on game design and the industry as a whole. The resume he has built since Kirby in his early 20s has earned Masahiro Sakurai a visible profile that equals that of Shigeru Miyamoto. It would be fair to say that the younger generation of Nintendo fans respect and admire the creator of Kirby in the same way that the older generation did to the creator of Mario not long before. Satoru Iwata, producer of Kirby's Adventure, as well as Dreamland, and a long list of classic games before then, became president of HAL Laboratory in 1993. His leadership, with a helping hand from Nintendo, steered the company out of financial troubles to profitability by the end of the 1990s. In 2000, he joined the board of directors at Nintendo and was promoted to president of the company in 2002 replacing Hiroshi Yamauchi, who retired from the company after 53 years. During the Iwata era of Nintendo, the company saw a reversal of fortunes, with the Wii and DS selling over 100 million units each, while being supported with a lineup of games that gave gamers around the world years of entertainment. He passed away at the age of 55 on July 11, 2015. He will be missed and never forgotten. While Mario gets the spotlight for his influence and popularity in making Nintendo what it is today, it's arguable that after analyzing the chain of events that stemmed from Kirby, the influence of the character, those early games, and the team at HAL Laboratory altered the course of the company more than Mario or any other game had since the 1980s. Without Kirby, it's possible that HAL would have run out of money and closed down, like many other small publishers have done. What would the modern day look like without Nintendo breathing life into Kirby? Surely, I never want to find out. Este es Marvis y usted es Kirby de Nintendo. Como ustedes ven, Kirby no es grande como Max. No es atractivo. No tiene grandes muñecas. Tampoco tiene armas. Lo único que tiene es un apetito feroz. Mientras más aventuras, más apetito le da a Kirby. Por eso se da un banquete con sus enemigos. En este juego, Kirby aplica diferentes trucos para ayudarse en su camino por la tierra de los sueños que se encuentra plagada de pesadillas. Disfrútala así. Cómetelo todo con Kirby de Nintendo. Exige tu sello. If you are of a certain age, say, born between 1975 and 1983, then you probably grew up on the 8-bit family computer or Nintendo Entertainment System, even if you started on Atari beforehand or had a Sega Master System or something else. The presence of Nintendo still hung over everything during those peak days. 
If you were around then, I'm sure you remember the switch tracks we all stood in front of during the early 90s, when 16-bit opened the door to the next level of gaming. A lot of us jumped over to the Sega site early, while others waited for the Super NES. Maybe a few went somewhere else or stopped playing entirely. But there was one more path, staring us all right in the face that most ignored. Sticking with the good old 8-bit Nintendo. I know I got on board with 16-bit as fast as I could. What futurist technophile wouldn't? But unlike many old NESs out there, my old gray box kept running. I kept up to date with the newer releases, ignoring all the movie-based games, of course, but kept watching the machine reach its maximum potential, amazed that such an old piece of hardware could keep delivering games and maintain a profit. When Kirby's Adventure showed up in May 1993, it was a jaw-dropping moment. Not in the way that Super Mario World, Sonic the Hedgehog, or Street Fighter II made people stop and take notice. It was not that the parameters of gaming were about to expand thanks to new technology. It was that old technology presented something no one was expecting, both from a technical perspective as well as the timing of an 8-bit release. It made me happy to know that I had that original Nintendo still plugged in, rather than giving it away for a few bucks to buy a new 16-bit cartridge. And when that new NES came out in 1993, I was the first in line to buy one. Thank the Lord! No more blinking red light, but also that, in a 16-bit world, 8-bit lived on. The 1993 NES offering was pretty good overall, with many of those games commanding top dollar today, thanks to the high demand and scarcity of these quality games. And it was all led by Kirby and his flagship game that year. When 1993 turned to 94, the writing was on the wall. The days of the 8-bit were finally numbered. For the first time ever, weeks and months went by with zero NES games coming out. It was a shock for anyone who was still paying attention. Thanks to the emerging used game market, the NES didn't end with Wario's Woods. All those games from 92, 93, 94 that slipped by could be picked up for next to nothing. You think I could afford every game new in box on day one? Of course not! Don't believe anyone who says they did. But with so-called worthless NES games, some only a year old, selling for $2 each, it was a great way to build a large library for next to nothing at least until emulation came and saved the day, and some money. Without Kirby's Adventure and some of those other games, the old War Horse NES would have been put out to pasture far too early, without a great send-off, denying many users, some around since the very beginning, a few more years of fun and entertainment. In the years that followed, I'd have people over who would often gawk at the large amount of 8-bit games I had, as well as that weird, smaller Nintendo I had to play them on. Some would laugh and dismiss it, saying that after Sonic or Mario World, they never looked back. Others had no NES memories at all. That's when I would reach for that copy of Kirby's Adventure, pop it in, and say, let me show you what you've been missing. I once saw this prize machine at the airport that was filled with Kirby dolls. Hey, life imitates art. 